and welcome to Coronanomics, brought to you by Econ Films. This week, inequality and the pandemic. The coronavirus pandemic has underlined the many deep social and economic fractures within countries, divides of race, class, education and income. But will it end up exacerbating them too? And what impact will this crisis have on global inequality? Could the pandemic paradoxically end up making for a more equal planet? I'm Ben Chu, Economics Editor of The Independent. And I'm Lizzie Burden, Economics Reporter at The Telegraph. We'll be your guides, and if you like what we're doing, please hit the subscribe button as it helps people to find us. Joining us this week is Sarangus Deaton, the 2015 Nobel Laureate in Economics, who's Professor Emeritus of Economics and International Affairs at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's currently leading the landmark IFS Deaton Review of Inequalities, which is funded by the Nuffield Foundation. Sarangus, welcome to Coronanomics. Saranga, speaking to the US Congress back in June, you said the pandemic is exposing and exaggerating long-standing inequalities in health and wealth. It will worsen the inequalities between black and white, between the more and less educated, and between ordinary people and the well-off. There's also been evidence of this unequal impact in the UK, as this chart, which we're going to see from the IFS Deaton Review of Inequalities, shows. The most deprived tenth of areas are on the right and the least deprived are on the left. What it shows is that the COVID death rates have been much higher in more deprived areas of the country. So first of all, can you tell us why do you think that COVID is having this grossly unequal impact? It's clear that a lot of it's to do with jobs um, so that um, people do work that puts them in danger. Many of the people who work in supermarkets, who work in meatpacking plants, um, who are doing the work that's the emergency workers who are keeping us all together, um, have to take risks. And those jobs are not doable remotely. And so that's the most immediate divide um, that happens that way. Um, in the US, I think there are other divides. We don't fully know why Blacks and Hispanics have been doing so badly. Um, it's some, some people blame the healthcare system. I, I think the hospitals to which African Americans have access are much worse, much less well provided than the other hospitals. But it may be just to do with the jobs they do. And again, we're going to have to sort that out over time. Is it possible, and people have talked about this in the UK context, that this could change attitudes to the people doing those jobs, that people will, there will be pressure for better terms, better protections, better pay for those people, so that one of the legacies of this crisis could actually be perhaps a reduction in inequality. Is there that same sense in the US? I hope so. <laughs> but I think it's a lot of it's wishful thinking. I mean, there are a lot of other forces going on which are not indicative that there's going to be increase in pay for the people who are not doing so very well. Um, look at the stock market in the UK, in the US, for example. Um, the stock market, of course, is the discounted present value of future profits, or that's what it's supposed to be. So the fact that it's doing very well while there's large scale unemployment um, makes one think that the stock market investors think that um, this is going to continue and the, 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 the pen, after the pandemic, the distribution of income will further tip towards capital and away from labor. And I think it's certainly true. There's a lot more public sympathy, especially in Britain, um, for um, frontline workers. Um, but I'm not sure what the mechanism would be that would turn that into higher wages. Mm. And the returns to education, in, in a way, as you've been describing, one of the new returns is a health return, because as you've been saying, people who are better educated are better able to work from home. Uh, whereas if you don't have a, a, a degree, a higher level degree, you may be have to go out and face COVID. Uh, just talk a little bit more about how that could uh, exacerbate those inequalities and also deaths of despair which you've done a huge amount of research in. Is this going to accelerate that trend? Or what, what are your thoughts? Well, we don't know about the acceleration of trend. I mean, deaths of despair are deaths from suicide, they're deaths from alcoholic liver disease, and they're deaths from drug overdoses. Um, there's been a lot of speculation that the social isolation um, and perhaps despair 
associated with the pandemic will accelerate those deaths. But we don't really have any hard data. The, the, the data I've seen so far for the US um, does suggest that alcohol sales have been going up and more than you would expect. And it's clear that drug deaths are going up, but they were going up through 2019 and into the pandemic. So I'm not sure there's any more of that. But let me take another aspect of that, which is that before the pandemic, these deaths of despair, you know, about running at about 160,000 deaths a year, um, much less than COVID, but these are going to go on forever. And in a normal year, maybe there'd be 60,000, you know, if you go back 20 years. So there's 100,000 extra people dying a year um, from deaths of despair. And if you split those up by their level of education, almost none of those people have a college, a four year college degree. And, you know, that's a huge divide. And in fact, you know, if you look at life expectancy at 25, sometimes called adult life expectancy, that reached its peak in 2012. It's never got back there again. And yet, if you look at people who have a four year college degree, their life, their adult life expectancy continues to rise. Um, and all the decline in life expectancy is accounted for by people who don't have a college degree. So you have that huge divide going on pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic's going to come along and um, make that worse. And what about the uh, US healthcare system? You know, if access to it depends on employers, what's the impact when the private sector's in trouble? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, <laughs> we argue in our book that Providing healthcare through employment is a completely crazy system that's destroying the labor market for working class people. And that was before the pandemic. Um, and of course, what the pandemic has done is shown that there's another sort of craziness, which is if you have mass unemployment, a large number of people lose their jobs, then they're going to lose their health insurance at the same time. Something just didn't happen in Britain at all. You could still go on to the National Health Service. You know, you don't see people cheering in the streets here or cheering at football matches um, saying, thank you, American healthcare system, <laughs> <laughs> because that's not what happens. No one's out there beating drums um, for the healthcare system. They're, they're certainly beating drums for individual healthcare workers. But it's been a terrible threat to people that they lose. Many people lost their health insurance. Millions of people lost their health insurance when they lost their jobs. Mm. I want to move on to look a little bit deeper into global inequality. Um, we've spoken already about people at the middle to lower end of the income scale in the UK and the US, but on an international level, they're actually relatively well off. And this was famously demonstrated in Branko Milanovic's elephant graph. It shows how between 1988 and 2008, incomes grew for most of the world's population. But there's a big exception uh, that we've just highlighted in the West for people in the 80th percentile on the chart. Uh, that's at the bottom of the elephant's trunk. And um, so, Angus, what impact do you expect the pandemic to have on inequality globally? Branko tells me the trunk has gone away. So oh. that, that graph is no longer there because, after all, um, the people at the very top didn't do quite as well um, since 2008 as they had done before. But let me come to the pandemic and international inequality, which I think is very interesting and very, very puzzling. And I haven't seen it very much um, discussed. Um, which is that traditionally, if you plot a graph with life expectancy on the vertical axis and um, income per capita on the horizontal axis, you get what is called the Preston curve after Sam Preston, who first drew that curve. And there's a very close positive relationship between health and income. So that the countries that are doing very badly, the poor countries of the world, are also the countries where life expectancy is really bad. So people get this double burden of inequalities. Not only do they have low incomes throughout their lives, but they have shorter lives. They're more likely to lose their children. That's the sort of thing I wrote about in my previous book, The Great Escape. What is interesting is if you take the data, say, from the Oxford World, um, our world in data, absolutely splendid job they've done during the pandemic before, um, and you plot the number of deaths per million against GDP per capita across countries, then what you find is, again, a very strong correlation. But it's exactly the wrong way round. 
the number of deaths per million are much higher in richer countries than they are in poorer countries, um, which is really the opposite of what you would expect. I mean, rich countries have great hospitals, they have great health care, um, you know, they're organized to deal with things like this. Um, would you rather face the pandemic in London or would you rather face it in, you know, the Central African Republic, for instance? I, I mean, I know which I would choose. And yet, if you look at the data, you know, London is doing much worse um, than most African capitals, for instance. Now, of course, let me go back to something I said at the very beginning. This pandemic is developing. So when it's all over, well, let's hope in a year or two, we'll look back at this and that correlation might have completely gone away. It might have settled back to the usual thing, which is the risk countries did better than the poorer countries. It might also be that our data are lousy. It may be that these low levels of deaths in poor countries are just because no one's really counting. And if we were counting properly, they wouldn't go away. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And so there really seems to be a genuine puzzle here that the number of deaths are much lower in poorer countries than you might expect. It's partly because they're much younger. Mm. So that keeps us done um, quite a bit. But you know, if that pattern stays, then the world is going to become much more equal, um, at least if the loss of GDP is sort of proportional or strongly positive related um, to the number of people who are dying per million. And that is really interesting. We've already seen it already that China, you know, which controlled the pandemic very early, um, is already growing reasonably rapidly, not as rapidly as it was, while the US is contracting. So for instance, in total GDP per capita, um, the US and China are, were about the same the last time we measured, um, but the next time we're gonna measure, China is gonna be ahead, sorry, not per capita, in total GDP. Mm. Per capita GDP, China will remain um, much poorer um, than the US. But of course, if China's growing faster than the US, it's taking these middle income people in China and bringing them closer to the top, and that will still reduce global inequality. So it's entirely possible, I think, that when all the dust has died down and we get a chance to look at reasonably stable data, that, well, I'm sure international patterns will have changed, um, but it may be that they've become more equal, um, both in terms of health and in terms of income. A very surprising outcome. But even though it sounds kind of dark, isn't it to be welcomed that that global inequality gap is closing? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, killing people off may make the world more equal, but we'd rather people didn't do it. So this is a mm. bad thing, not a good thing. You know, what I'm really concerned with is what happens to people's standard of living, what happens to their longevity. And, you know, the, the, the reduction in global income inequality in the past has reflected the success of places like India and China that have taken many millions of people out of poverty and brought them up to something like a global middle class. Now, um... You've written, Sarangus, that uh, the excessive power given to U.S. states in the U.S. Constitution has hampered uh, that country's ability to fight against the virus. But many in the U.K. here argue that more power should be given to devolved and local English authorities. You may have seen recently a major standoff between Manchester and the central government over localised lockdowns and the question of inadequate compensation for households and businesses who are forced to close by new restrictions. Let's listen to Andy Burnham, the Greater Manchester Mayor, speaking recently. The North is fed up of being pushed around. We aren't going to be pushed uh, around anymore. This is a pandemic when people's lives, jobs, homes, businesses are at stake. You know, this isn't just a game, people playing politics. This is real. The North stands on the brink of being back into where we were in the 1980s, just, you know, forgotten and, and pushed pushed aside, but we won't let that happen. And that's why we're taking this uh, this stand. Now, you can hear the passion uh, in his voice there. But on the policy side, is the mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, right or wrong to say that it's better to allow local authorities to take a lead uh, in uh, measures to combat this virus, Sir Angus? No, he's, he's not wrong. Um, I, I've been following this a little bit. I love that speech, though. 
And mm -hmm. uh, that's presumably from the left against the right, but whereas in the US, that sort of sentiment is being expressed by the right against the left. <laughs> it, it's the sort of right wing governors who refuse to lock down or take orders um, from the center. But I think in both countries, well, let's put it this way. Um, there's a role for the center and there's a role for the states or for cities or for localities. That's clearly right. There's much more information locally and local people should be able to make a whole bunch of decisions for themselves. Though, of course, they can't be completely by themselves. You know, it, one of the things we had in America was in South Dakota, you know, they had an assembly of half a million people on motorcycles arrived in the middle of the pandemic from all over the United States and then dispersed carrying the virus with them. Now, the, the city in South Dakota decided it needed that money and it wasn't going to cancel this rally, even if they knew what was going to happen. Now, it's not clear one would have as much sympathy with that, but what has been clear in both countries has been a massive failure of the center to fulfill its role. I mean, it's the one that's responsible for providing testing, for instance. It's the one that has to provide the science as a background for those decisions. And that has certainly not happened here. I think it's been better in Britain, but pretty catastrophic there too. Mm. What I, ask you, think, I think it's better than catastrophic, yeah. But even given all those failures at the center, which are pretty well recognized, the argument against Andy Burnham and what he's doing is that essentially he is holding up uh, an important health restriction in the Northwest on account of money. Uh, and that if, it, if there isn't a resolution reached very soon, there could be very serious health consequences, not just for the Northwest, not just for Manchester, but for the whole UK. Under those circumstances, isn't it actually legitimate for Boris Johnson to say, I'm sorry, but the centre is going to decide ultimately? Well, it's a battle and it's going to be a battle. You know, if you read the stories of the plague in 14th century Italy, exactly those same battles were being fought out. So fought out. You know, the administrations would shut down the cities and everyone would go along with it until the harvest came in and then the wine merchants wanted to sell their stuff. And so, you know, they had a huge fight with the administrators and in some city they won it and in other cities they lost. Any sort of infectious disease is going to provide these, um, you know, these difficulties. What I find very difficult here is the complete failure by um, many politicians to recognize that other people matter at all. So they talk about personal responsibility, for instance, and that really is pretty close to evil in this thing. It's just denying that people have any responsibility for other people at all. And that uh, looking after yourself is the only thing that matters. I mean, I spoke, I asked you earlier about um, the, whether there's a good side to um, reducing global inequality. In the UK, it seems that some inequalities are closing, but it's not because as this government's flagship policy, the country's levelling up, it's left behind regions. Rather, it does seem that some areas are being levelled down, kind of similar to what you were saying about, you know, you don't want to do that. Uh, if, if, you know, there isn't a good side to closing inequality the wrong way. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the trouble is always is that inequality is very important, but it cannot ever be an aim by itself, right? Um, not because, the, and the classic argument against that is not the leveling up, but the leveling down argument. You know, if we're all dead, we're all equal in the grave, and you've abolished inequality, but you don't have anything left. And the trouble with the pandemic is there's real danger that it can bring about some inequality that way. I wrote a piece about this at the very beginning of the pandemic, which I think was not very well understood. But, you know, the, the rich will do better than the poor whenever there's a mechanism for them to do so. And if you go back in history in Britain, um, you know, when there were smallpox epidemics in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was very little difference between how the aristocrats did and how the ordinary people did. And that wasn't because the aristocrats didn't have lots of power. They did. They were very powerful people. But no one knew how to stop getting smallpox. Right? So the disease was out of control. 
And once vaccination was understood and before that variolation, then the rich people started getting it. And you can actually see the gap in life expectancy really opening up in Britain after 1750, when first the royal family, and then it percolated down through the Dukes and so on. Um, the first variolation and then vaccination made a difference, but you need a mechanism for it. Mm. And so at the very beginning of this disease, it was very notable that even now, you know, presidents and prime ministers are catching this um, disease. But it turned out very quickly that in the modern world, with all the technology that we have, there were lots of ways for better off people, better educated people to protect themselves. And that, you know, became clear very, very quickly. It didn't take 100 yeah. years or two. On the subject of history, we spent much of the past four years talking about the impact of Brexit, and then suddenly the pandemic's come along and kind of eclipsed it. But Brexit is back on the agenda, as you will know. And a lot of people right. are talking about what are the long term impacts of that economically? Have you got thoughts on what the economic uh, on what the impacts on inequality uh, of a no deal Brexit would be, Sir Angus? Well, one of the things I've read recently that does worry me is this concern that, um, you know, the, the British government is about to abrogate its treaties, um, which were made to make the, the Northern Ireland question um, go away. And one of the reasons was because um, they wanted to be closer. They wanted to be able to pick winners in the business community, for instance. Now, I think the EU has been very successful at preventing that by having quite effective antitrust things, which took the authority away from government. So it was hard for individual industries in Germany or France or whatever. They couldn't um, persuade their local governments, their national governments, to do things because those things had been assumed into EU law. And that was very effective because it gave um, countries a way of holding off predatory behavior by corporations. One of the things that I'm worried that I hear is that, that you know, you'll get that back in Britain again, and that would be bad. Mm. Um, so, Angus, you told Congress that the pandemic may turn tolerable inequalities into intolerable inequalities, um, and there's a danger of social unrest. Um, we've previous, we've obviously had the Black Lives Matter protests in the US and the UK, um, but there seems to be a particularly febrile atmosphere in the US, uh, with protests in Portland lasting over 100 days, a militia plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan, do you see this anger as having been stoked partly by the pandemic? And I wonder if you're worried about the potential for right wing voters after the US election. Yeah, very much so. I think anyone is worried about that. Healthcare in America has been intolerable for really a long time or unequal for a really long time. And to most of us who think about it, it seems like it ought to be intolerable. And for some strange reason, um, it's not. Um, we pay twice as much as any other country. We have some of the worst life expectancies um, of any rich country in the world. And because it's, a, it's done through employment, um, then there's effectively this poll tax. Um, in Britain, you know about poll taxes and what terrible things they do. But there's effectively a poll tax on employment, um, which is used to pay for this incredibly expensive health care. And then at the same time, and unlike what has happened in Europe, um, pharma companies are allowed to make huge sums of money by addicting and killing people um, by handing out OxyContin and essentially legalized heroin. So you have this terrible predatory healthcare system that's sucking up enormous numbers of money and is killing people and is driving our life expectancy down. You know, Anne and I wrote a piece in the New York Times arguing that, um, you know, there was some chance that at the end of the pandemic, these tolerated inequalities would become completely intolerable. And I think there's still some chance of that. It depends a lot on just what happens. Um, you know, is there going to be a vaccine or are the pharma companies going to make enormous sums of money out of producing a vaccine and charging large sums of money for it? But there could be hundreds of thousands of people with enormous medical bills that they can't pay. Um, people who still don't have a vaccine, vaccine for some, vaccine not for others. I think this would add to a very volatile situation. And I think, you know, what Joe Biden is proposing won't solve the problem, but it certainly would help it. Um, and 
you know, maybe maybe we'll come out of this, but maybe they won't, and then there'll be some sort of violent <laughs> reaction to this. Mm. I mean, we've talked about local, national, international, race, class, and gender inequality. Have the fault lines of inequality changed fundamentally because of this pandemic? We talked a little bit about the beginning about who was dying, and that's changing. Um, because Hispanics in America have traditionally and oddly had better health than whites. Um, and that has been reversed during the pandemic. You know, blacks were not much affected by deaths with despair before 2013. And then as fentanyl spread into inner city communities, that began to happen too. Um, and so, you know, the COVID has reinforced something bad that was already happening. I mean, one thing that's a familiar inequality is the stock market is doing great, right? So not only can people like me sit at home um, and work and even earn money sometimes by doing Zooms or whatever, you know, um, we're doing great. And then every time we look at our retirement portfolio, you know, there's another huge increase um, in the funds we have available. And why is that huge increase happening? Because the stock market thinks we're going to screw the workers even more in the future. Right. <laughs> so that's that's a sort of new inequality. And most people equate the stock market with the state of the economy and not as a measure of profits only. So that inequality, I think, will was already becoming more salient. You know, when, when I was studying economics in Cambridge in the 60s, we did um, talk about the functional distribution of incomes. It's called the distribution between profits and, and wages. And, you know, John Robinson and all the um, Cambridge Keynesians um, really worried about that quite a lot. And then even then, Tony Atkinson was doing sterling work on the personal distribution of income, which has really taken the place of the functional distribution of income in most discussions. Mm -hmm. And now I think the functional distribution of income is coming back again um, because it's changing against labor. Well, as Lizzie said, Sir Angus, that's been a truly panoramic perspective of the impact of the pandemic on inequality. So thanks so much for talking us through it. And thanks for appearing on Coronanomics. We'll be talking to many more top thinkers in the weeks ahead to discuss how we can weather the economic storm of COVID-19. So please do stay tuned and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember, if you like what we're doing, please hit like and share. And if you'd like to talk to us, just leave us a comment below. This has been Coronanomics, brought to you by Econ Films.